Oh, hello there, and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number 398. That's 398. I'm hoping it's 398. It should be 398. And if it isn't, then welcome to 398. How you doing? How you feeling? Great. Amazing. How am I? You know, same old. Hanging on in there for dear life, as per usual, trying my best to ensure that I wake up the next day with a smile on my face. If it's your first time checking out the show via YouTube, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and of course, leave me a comment down below. And if you're listening via the podcast app, download, give it a five-star review, and share it amongst all your friends. And as always, support via Patreon is more than welcomed. Click the link down below, patreon.com for just Agostino. That's patreon.com for just A-G-O-S. T I N H O for as little as one dollar or one pound per month, you get access to my entire audio library as well as this show in full audio format, plus a bonus patron only show that's going to be coming every week exclusively on Patreon. So make sure you jump on there, back the kid, support the vibe, get on the train, hit your ride along my wagon, as sus as that may sound, do whatever it needs be to make sure you're part of it. Yes, here we are, locking in, clocking in, trying to get this, what, lockdown 2.0 out of the way. It feels like, again, I haven't been outside, I've not really seen the outside world, I don't know what people are getting up to because I'm abiding by the rules, but I do get the feeling everyone's sort of like collectively holding their breaths, right? Don't you get that feeling if you're from the UK or you're from, you know, um, the west part of the world, yeah? the western hemisphere you've probably have felt that collective like holding of breath everyone's just waiting to kind of get over this hump now i have a theory or i have an idea or i have a feeling that there's going to be a bit of a spar in the work and most likely most you know most places especially places like the uk where we tend to love an over celebration when it comes to you know public holidays such as you know christmas new year's eve and new year's day I've got a feeling the government here, especially if the numbers aren't looking that spicy or aren't looking as great as they could be, there could be a scenario where we get to the end of this supposed second lockdown, which is what the beginning of December, some sometime around December 2nd. And I can definitely envisage somebody coming out and saying, hey, guys, this thing hasn't worked out. We're going to need to be under some sort of lockdown until, guess what, New Year. That's going to cover their bases and make sure people don't go too crazy on Christmas and also don't go too crazy on New Year. Because if you let, because I don't know, just again, going by what I've seen on, you know, online and reading what and kind of interpreting what people have said, you know, far more intelligent people than myself. There is this feeling that once people start to get a bit comfortable and feel like, you know, they don't need to be as a, they don't need to be as vigilant as they did maybe in the beginning, people get a bit lax. That's when the virus number starts to like creep up, right? Cases start to creep up. The other number starts to go up. Hospitalization, bloody blah, 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 blah. You know the story. So it could be argued that those occasions have usually come off the back of a, you know, um, a nice time in the se- a nice time in the year, whether it was summer, whether it's holiday season, just before fall. So there could be an aspect where if people got start going out and really going out properly, right, especially around Christmas and New Year's, what's to say when it comes to the actual New Year, like let's say January, February, March, that the numbers aren't incredibly high again? Now the only way this could obviously work is if somehow between the months, no, sometime somehow between this month, November, all the way into the new year, a vaccine is somehow rolled out to the public or is you know goes through the various stages of testing and rolled out, you know, quite quickly after the fact. That could of course protect everybody and, you know, basically render lockdown basically null and void. But I don't know, man. It's looking a little bit dicey from what I've seen. Again, maybe because everyone's holding their breath collectively and no one's really kind of paying attention to what they actually should and shouldn't be doing, which is understandable, you know, being a year under in lockdown with no idea as to the as to when you're going to get out of it, it can get a bit tiring, you know, listening to public health experts debate and argue amongst each other. You know, some of, you know, some of the guys and girls who maybe sound like they're in the pockets of some big, you know, pharmaceutical agency. It can be a bit difficult to read exactly what's going on, but, you know, gladly or happily, you don't come to this podcast for that sort of information. You come here for a little bit of respite from all that stuff. So, 
loads of stuff to get into loads of um interesting cultural topics to dive on deep in so make sure you grab yourself a drink a little bit of a snack or whatever you've got in your hand puff something injects ingest something you know pour something into your eyes whatever that you do and let's dive on deep so number one topic that i went to kind of expound on a little bit that i saw perusing the interwebs is it me Am I the only one getting a little bit fatigued or a little bit bored of seeing, you know, X, Y, Z celebrity out holidaying, partying, living it up, celebrating their born day as if nothing is occurring in the world right now? Now, of course, we understand privilege exists. We understand, you know, that's one of the trappings of being ultra wealthy is the fact that you can essentially you know detach yourself from the from the everyday goings on in the world you can sort of kind of you know inoculate yourself in some regard i think if you watch the last Zars on netflix you know exactly how you know detached um the highfalutin you know world to do blue-blooded wealthy folk can be from the 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 plight of the average regular average regular everyday person but i guess in this day and age it comes across a little bit more I won't say disingenuous. It just comes across a little bit taste more taste than it would done previously, just because of how connected we are. Right? It's literally impossible for a celebrity or somebody that happens to be a public figure to not understand what's going on in the world unless they purposely go out of their way not to engage with it. All they have to do is go into their mentions, click on one, click on one person's profile who's commented on their picture or liked something that they've done you know, dig through on their account and you can definitely see how the other side is living quick, pretty quickly, pretty easily. Now, whether or not they want to do that and whatnot, it's another thing, but it's pretty easy to get a kind of read on what's going on, right? Just chuck in a geotag on any social media platform and you could, you know, quite quickly get an idea on, you could kind of get a reading, a tone of what the general conversation is in that city, right? In that neighborhood, in that country, in that locale, whatever it may be. So when you're seeing celebrities such as this video I'm going to play now of Diddy and Turks and Caicos, you know, celebrating his birthday with a whole bevy of A-listers. It does kind of rub you up the wrong way, right? In terms of like, we know these people aren't going through what we're going through, me and you, right? Every day. We know that. We know that's a fact. It's happening. You know, there's no surprise. But having it rubbed in your face consist constantly that, you know, there are other people just not experiencing this thing the same way that you're experiencing in any, not even like, let's say, you know, it's all well and good. You can get, it's easy to have a little bit of some, it's easy to, you know, to have your nose bent out of shape when a friend of yours is, you know, maybe uh, striving and surviving through COVID a bit easy, a bit better than you are, right? Imagine you've been unemployed for eight months, your friend is still hold on to their job. They've somehow managed to get a promotion, you know, the atmosphere in their workplace is better than ever. Your place is completely toxic. It, you're allowed to feel a little bit, you know, away at that. Imagine how much more away that you're going to feel when you turn on your, you know, open up your favorite social media platform and see one of your favorite artists parading around on a beach somewhere, acting as if nothing's going on in the world out there. It can get old very, very quickly. And that's exactly what I kind of feel. Again, not, you know, no hating on what they're doing. I understand, you know, if you've got the means to do it, why not? But there is a point where you just have to be like, is there a, a, an understanding of reading a room of understanding what's going on around you? Or is it just do what I please and, you know, ask for forgiveness later. But this is the video anyway of it, Diddy and Turks and Caicos, courtesy of Two Quarter Blog. <laughs> Silk shirts in abundance, many uh, many are donning Versace, Roberto Cavalli, and whatever else they can probably find. You know the kind of gowns and attire you only wear when you're um, walking. Um, you know, sh you know, barefoot on a beach somewhere with linen trousers with too much Tom Ford on, and a poor Rican girl doesn't know to speak much English. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, it looks fun as fuck, right? It looks really fun, but Jesus, man. Oh, 
I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just reading way too much into it, but it does come across a little bit. Okay, too much shouting there. Sorry, but but yeah, maybe it's just me. I don't know. Who knows? Maybe it's just me in that regard. And no one actually, I guess most people probably don't even know these things are happening and they just kind of uh, step away from it in a very uh, healthy manner as opposed to what I'm doing at the moment, which doesn't, definitely doesn't help things. But hey, ho, what can you do? Next on the list, we have fairly encouraging news courtesy of Axios regarding a fully rapid COVID test that you can do at home, at home testing. Now, obviously, there's a, I mentioned at the top of the show that I kind of get the feeling that the good vibes and the overall, um, what's that? Is it good vibes? Is it good vibes is the right word to use here. Probably not good vibes. I get the feeling that overall, there does seem to be a little bit of a better sentiment around the vaccine now i guess maybe of course with the news that's basically leaked as of the other day regarding it's a 90 percent um effective whatever it was that i I previewed the other day on the podcast so it does feel as if there's a bit there's a bit better momentum going behind it people are feeling a little bit optimistic and you know of course the covid and lockdown fatigue is sort of setting in and people just want any solution that they can sort of move on with their lives or get back to some sort of level of normalcy my thinking with it would be that if then if the vaccine doesn't come available anytime soon they're going to just have to ramp up testing and just get people back out working again and i don't think the economy can survive being under some sort of this level of restrictions or lockdown for another year it just won't it's just impossible so i can imagine or i can foresee a future where they just look be like look let's ramp up the testing let's get people um tested as soon as possible um so they can stay at home stay in place if need be um let's look after the sick and the vulnerable and just move on from there and whenever the vaccine is available it's available but this sort of news as well is very interesting because it have could have some impact in my world which is the electronic music dance music you know nightclub scene that could obviously be something that could be used in terms of getting those places up and running um you know in the interim whilst we're looking for a vaccine to actually get us over the finishing line but this is a article here from axios it says exclusive fully at home rapid covid test to move forward let's zoom this a little bit bigger it says here two companies behind at home rapid covid19 tests are releasing encouraging clinical trial results ahead of applying for an emergency use authorization eua company executives tell axios now some conspiracy theorists could argue that it's very convenient that all this news is currently being leaked um in the afterglow of the supposed election win of joe biden right why didn't this happen prior who knows is it something mischievous going on is it just coincidental timing i personally don't believe in coincidence when it comes to politics or you know uh, when it comes to celebrities and politics and and anything concerning you know whatever government figures i just don't believe in coincidence some things are definitely calculated to some extent but hey what do i know why it matters it says here antigen tests could quickly provide results at home would be a major help in identifying and slowing the spread of COVID-19, but they have to get into the hands of consumers at an affordable price. Driving the news, Celex, a biotechnology company, and Gauss, a um, computer vision startup, are announcing today that their rapid at-home coronavirus test um, achieved a sensitivity rate of 94% and a specificity rate uh, of 97 compared to the PCR gold standard of lab test in a recent clinical trial so you could definitely see why this could be beneficial for clubs and stuff going forward because if you're able to because obviously you know if there isn't a solution if this doesn't get rolled out you could definitely see a aspect you definitely can see a future where a club could basically um hard you know basically including the price of the ticket or add on to the price of the ticket most most probably um an option for you to get a test right where you'd kind of rock up at a specific time uh before the actual event kicks off get your test done and then you wait for your results once you get your results that's then when you can go and, be and click your ticket to go to the event itself right so anywhere between 10 to 50 pounds i could end up thinking happening but the other way it could really happen too is if the um organizers and promoters or venue promoters, whoever they are, 
they put together a list of um, agencies and bodies that they sort of, um, you know, swear by their results and their test. And they basically say, hey, if you get a test from one of these people or one of these groups, one of these apps, and you're basically able to prove that you're, you know, negative of COVID, you can come to our event. And then, of course, you offset the price or you offset the fee back onto the customer so you can still keep on charging your regular, you know, anywhere between five euros to 30 euro ticket for an entry without having to slap on an extra bit of fee. I can definitely see that happening going forward. Um, it, can, it continues here. It says sensitivity refers to a test ability to identify a true positive cases while specific, specific, specific specificity refers to its ability to find true negatives those results are encouraging enough for the companies to move forward for an application for an eua from the fda which is needed to fast track the test for home use the bigger picture Celex and gauss are among dozens of companies facing uh, racing to produce and market rapid at home test but according to the washington post this week no firm has yet applied for the fda for authorization so it's a bit of a long way away but it's still encouraging that these are the these are sort of things that are being pushed and sort of worked on behind the scenes in order to kind of get us back to some level of normality it continues here one concern about at home tests is that the results may flow may not flow to officials leaving them in the dark on covid19 spread though selects and girls have partnered with a data integration platform to transmit test results bottom line cheap test at home could be a game changer for the pandemic but only if they're accurate and only if people can take steps to isolate themselves after the positive results of course that's you could you know it's we're not going to be able to force anybody to stay at home in quarantine you know we saw what happened in china we saw how you know the scores of army officials were rocking up to buildings and essentially you know uh uh what's the thing called sealing the door shuts on people's homes so they couldn't leave chucking people in the back of you know industrial size looking like freezer fridges type things i remember in the beginning some lady was was dragged kicking and screaming for a flat and chucked into the back of some sort of food transportation gizmo or whatever it may be called that's never going to happen in you know the uh sophisticated west uh western side of his hemisphere so the best that they can do is provide the citizenship with as many tools as possible for people to diagnose themselves and get the results as quick as possible and of course making informed decisions but i think as an industry it's definitely helpful to have this ability to um essentially get your events get your organizations get your business up and running to a level some kind of level of course you're going to be running it to you know a reduced capacity somewhat i would imagine but it's good to have something there that you can kind of build upon um you know for the future going going ahead and um i can definitely see this being implemented especially in uh, clubbing events and stuff you know offsetting the feedback onto the customer telling them look if you're desperate to go out pay this 50 pound and i guess if you'll be if you're able the only but i guess the only negative of it would be that you have to you'd have to keep paying in order to go to the event so essentially work out the same way some of these la tiktokers are doing parties and hanging out with each other all the time they essentially just get tested around the clock to make sure they can hang out with their friends so that's what you probably have to do if you want to go out i'd assume which can get a bit bothersome which obviously can get a bit expensive very very quickly you know 50 50 to 100 dollars or maybe more per test you know every time you go out it's nothing to scoff at really um so yeah let's see how that develops but it's encouraging news none the less and then off the back of that off the back of that some encouraging news of course via the live music space um considering the stocks went soaring um of the news of a covid19 vaccine breakfast is currently from billboard it says live music stocks soar on covid19 vaccine breakthrough let's zoom in here because the text is tiny it says here uh stock prices for live music companies skyrocketed on monday monitoring morning sorry news that the covid19 vaccine was found to be 90 percent effective and obviously this is a big thing because i think prior to this you know all the sort of at home <clears throat> apps such as slack zoom skype you know mm -hmm, uh what's happened all these other things and house party were absolutely soaring around the stock market because of course you know people's had newfound interest in these platforms there was an idea that we were going to be under lockdown until 2022 so the immediate future was looking like a very much a at home um ai virtual reality 
um, augmented reality sort of you know existence and of course with this breakthrough with the vaccine it's given light to some industries where that were essentially dead on their feet right you can imagine live music promotion companies and audio visual companies and all these things you know even just your know, local shopping mall were essentially dead on their feet in the midst of covid so to have this news breakthrough is definitely going to reinvigorate that industry completely it's just following um article continues here it says at 9 15 a.m et just 13 minutes after the Pfizer press release with its vaccine trial results, Live Nation was 20%, 20.8% to 67 whatever dollars. Let's uh, go over the stats here. Um, developed by uh, biotech company Pfizer and BioNTech, the vaccine shows no serious side effects in a trial of 43,000 participants of racially and ethnically diverse backgrounds. Pfizer announced Monday morning trial participants were given two doses based 21 days apart. The drug was 90% effective seven days after the second dose, meaning the vaccine is effective within 28 days of the first dose. Pfizer noted the final vaccine efficient efficacy percentage may vary as the trial continues even when the vaccine is made available limited availability will remain but let's just continue here uh, companies related to live entertainment um oh it's a it says here yeah, sorry so the Pfizer has currently projects currently projects it will produce up to 50 million vaccine doses globally by the end of 2020 up to 1.3 billion doses in 2021 the u.s government has ordered 100 million doses um, once a vaccine is developed and combined additional 500 million in recent months live nation executives have said that the company's concert business will be running at scale in the summer of 2021 uh, most fans have held their tickets rather than seek refunds through the end of the third quarter live nation's global refund rate is 70 percent while festival refund rate is 37 percent hmm interesting that isn't it i think that's more to say that's more, that, that has more to do with the fact that live nation i think when they were when those first cancellations were coming about or the first sort of like postponements i'm pretty sure live nations um uh rules were that you couldn't get a refund you had to postpone you had to basically defer your ticket for the next year or you could sell it on but you couldn't get a refund directly through live nation so that sort of skews the statistics right and it makes it look a little bit better than what it is i think <clears throat> saying that you're going to put on live festival events in the summer of next year is very optimistic especially when you consider how long it will take to roll out the vaccine all this sort of stuff and get testing insurance of course for these events um people's you know again uh, whether or not people are going to be comfortable traveling to festivals hanging out in large groups of people like that it just seems a little bit far-fetched to assume that you could put on such a big event so quickly off the back of you know such a you know a massive uh, global pandemic such as this i don't really think that's true but again happy to see some encouraging signs for the industry um, it continues here it says company related companies related to live entertainment travel and tourism have been uh, especially battered in 2020 um, news of the vaccine has helped push these companies prices multiples above their pandemic low marks live nation now trades at 212.4 percent above its 2020 low of 21 uh point 70 uh america airline share prices is 55.4 above its 2020 and hilton worldwide is 134.4 above its pandemic low just imagine right the, the hilton group or hilton worldwide you know the amount of hotels and golf courses and casinos and all sorts of other nonsense that they own around the world that essentially survive off the back of tourism only right there's no other business that those guys attract or those guys sort of generate that comes outside of tourism so for you know that aspect of their business to completely be paused you look at places like las vegas which you could say is similar but i think there's probably a lot of people in north america who actually live there who probably travel to las vegas you know every other weekend to hang out do a bit of gambling and stuff as much as it is a tourist hub it also is a place where you can probably get away with having the the sort of domestic residents you know make up most of the customers and pr and probably do all right it would help of course if you opened it up internationally but it can survive but other places you know i'm assuming again like the hilton worldwide locations um they survive 
primarily of the back of the, of the strength of international um, tourists coming in and spending their hard-earned money so without them it's absolutely difficult so yeah um encouraging signs stock market is rebounding off the back of that good news so hopefully we have some good news in the future what else is next here oh <laughs> people are complaining about the dj mag top 100 list you know every year the same thing happens in it um a really weird um li- i wouldn't say a weird list i guess it's in a name in it because dj mag has dj written in the title it gives you this weird um idea that somehow is representative of the music that you're into right and i think most people have their sort of like favorite djs or people that they sort of listen to or even you know genre of music that they can kind of you know uh tap their feet to in a club or do a bit of a head nod right so you have an idea of what a good dj is or what you like and what you don't like so then when you see these people on these lists on the dj mag it sort of makes you think huh what the fuck's going on here this is like a parallel universe but i do think it's a bit unfair some of the criticism that come again none of these people i'll listen to and uh, you know i have any interest in going to see play live but i'm also understanding that when you watch some of these videos from tomorrowland of some of these people playing you know f- you know in front of thousands of people you know mollied out of their faces wearing you know all sorts of nonsense floral outfits they're quite clearly enjoying themselves and they quite clearly have come there because they're big fans of whoever's performing now of course merlin is not the best example because it's literally one of the biggest edm you know sort of festivals that exist in the world right maybe outside of maybe out of a couple other two so there is an aspect that you know how many of those people are actually attending are coming to see you or just coming just to attend because it's a big thing and they want to you know because festivals for the most part are pretty good value for their money in terms of the the people that you get to see over a short period of time but there's obviously a market for it that's basically my what i'm saying there's a big market for it i think i remember watching a youtube video once where some kid went to tomorrowland and instead of just going to the stage and seeing people perform he kind of turned the camera around and went around the actual villagey bit of itself where you know you get like you know street food market places to do your makeup you know merch shops like it's it's a completely immersive experience so i can definitely understand why somebody that would be into that sort of stuff which is a little bit too um a little bit too extra for my liking right a little bit too too many bells and whistles there but i get it and i think the djs on that list on this list anyway actually accurately reflect the vibe that i see in those videos and i don't know man it's it's voter driven for the most part the djs themselves promote it from all to all their fan base and tell people to kind of click on their name and get it out there and i don't know man it just represents a whole different side of dance music that i'm probably not that well versed in but i understand that there is some appeal to it as much as i don't get it you know the same people that listen to you know um generic top 40 hits on the radio when they're driving to work are maybe the same sort of people that wouldn't mind seeing a david getter a dimitri vegas and like mike a martin garrix an armin van buren and a look uh don diablo afrojack of course is a legend that regards steve aoki oliver heldens like who are these people the marshmallow cashmere and that's the embarrassing thing too right because you say who i could say who are these people in a very dismissive tone but these people are like multi multi millionaires right and they dj they're not even like artists in their some of them are artists in their own right but for the most part they're on this list primarily because of their ability to attract and pull you know audiences in the thousands right sell merch in the thousands singles and edits and remixes in the millions like it's pretty insane to think there's this side of dj culture exist and there's the other side where people are complaining about how many black people on the lineup how many women on the lineup right and it's this side of it where it's just pure and utter um nonsense music i think that you can't really discern but like i would love i would love to know if somebody else actually into this music could actually tell um any of these people apart um timmy trumpet marshmallow is that ks i was like cashmere i don't know pronounce that k-s-h-m-r uh skrillex w and rehab i would love it if somebody did a blind test and played some of their tunes maybe not the singles but maybe the b-sides and could legitimately tell the difference between all six of those guys i bet you couldn't 
I really bet you couldn't. But again, does that make them bad people or bad DJs? No, because some people actually legitimately enjoy this music. There's a whole industry built around this, right? You got Tiesto, Hardwell. Tiesto's fallen quite low in it's 16. Tiesto, Hardwell, Calvin Harris, Above and Beyond, Nervo, Lost Frequencies. Like, God almighty. You know, this also reminds me of, it reminds me of one time I went to go play a gig at some like student campus or student halls somewhere in West London. I forgot where it was. And it was maybe in my infancy, maybe in year two, year three, right? It's, there's always that early stage when you're doing, especially for myself and anyway, when I was teaching in the early beginning stages where you immediately think you're good enough to play in the background. You have these really, um, you know, uh, delusions of grandeur. You think, yeah, I'm good enough. I can, I can headline fabric. I'm, yeah, I mean, you just have these big things in your head. And then, and then there's always the one or two gigs that you get that really humble you and make you aware of like where your levels actually are. And this was one of them, but more so in the aspect of like being prepared. So I get booked to play this DJ thing, yeah, for the student campus place. And the only thing I'm told, again, I didn't do my research, but I'm told by the guy that's actually booking me that, hey, people here like house. And at that time I was going through my, you know, my sort of like, um, uh, what, what is it called? my strictly rhythm phase right i was just playing loads of house music i was really into that sort of vibe and i thought yeah i'm gonna pack my crate or pack my whatever i had at the time i think it was a controller or basically my playlist full of house music that i classify as house right traditional house right move your body dun, 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 whatever right like you know that's what i had in my house right chicago house um you know regular house music maybe the, the the furthest i could go to the pop side maybe some disclosure track i don't think they actually are around then let's say a jamie xx remix that could be contemporary but for the most part that's the kind of house i had i rock up to this event and you know they're all students kind of foreign kids they kind of look like me right similar sort of age similar sort of vibe and i start playing and they just don't like it at all and then i get told numerous times throughout the set right Again, the evil eye people are i play one song they dance i play another song they stop dancing and you're like sweating right sweating on your head you're getting evil eyes from the event organizer they're thinking you're terrible you're obviously doing a shit job because you're not prepared and then i finally realized that when they keep saying house music what they mean is this sort of stuff right like i think it's actually called contemporary house music it's sort of stuff that you hear um played on the opening sequence of like fifa or something right it's not necessarily it's like the stuff you might hear Nowadays, probably not because they have better, they have, te they have, te they have staff with better taste, but before it might be the music you'd hear in the top shop changing room, right? Or whatever it may be. So that's the stuff they wanted me to play and I didn't have it. And I guess since that experience and since having such a terrible, and again, you, there's nothing worse than playing a shit set and then having to then go to the bar manager or event book or whoever booked you and then ask for your money at the end of the gig. You feel like such a fraud. You feel like you're absolute, like, you feel like you've stolen the money. Well, of course you haven't. It's not your fault you did a bad job, but you did the job, innit? Um, and again, bad is subjective, but you know deep down you played absolute donkey dick. You suck donkey dick, right? You was horrible. And that's why I knew it was and I had to go to the end and ask the guy for money. And then I think ever since that time, I've had a real appreciation for that side of stuff because I know if I would have had the tracks that they liked, again, even if it was just like a top 50s, album of compilation of stuff that i could have just whacked in there and mixed up with the stuff that i went to play it would have went completely off they just went to hear the stuff that they've heard on the radio stuff they've heard on mixes stuff they've heard on youtube compilate on youtube compilations or on vlogs they want to hear the stuff that they've heard every single day played again for the middle nightclub it's a completely different audience but i understand that they exist so i think when people get a bit you know get their nose put out of shape about it most of it might just come from the fact that you know there is a hint of jealousy as well involved because like i said the money involved in this side of the industry is just obscene maybe it, maybe it's not that much different to the stuff that i'm into because i guess the guys in my scene guys and girls are probably a little bit more subtle with their spending unless you're like peggy goo right you just kind of uh wave your wealth in people's face but for the most part people are quite discreet with how they kind of show how well off they are and how well they do right you can tell by the gigs they get booked at and where they play and how much times they're flying around the world but for the most part they're quite subtle but these guys have like you know have their names in blazons on the side of private jets and stuff they rock up in rolls royces they have gold plated headphones uh, just obscenely crazy shit 
so that might make it a little bit hard to sort of sympathize and and you know have any sort of understanding about what they do but there is definitely an audience for it 100 percent um you've got eric pride here 22 freddie legrand again what names i've meant i know here vinnie vici the chain smokers i only know because of the controversy recently in new york right they put on an event and it got a bit too rowdy you got some guy called alan walker you got dj snake who we're obviously all familiar with in terms of um getting involved in the hip-hop side of things uh you got kai go who I have no idea who that is bass jackers vintage culture jesus christ imagine that being your dj name and that being one of your shots djing like there's there's not there's no there's no such thing as a good dj headshot and it doesn't really exist does it the vintage culture and you've got yourself in a leather jacket that's obviously a size too small for you according to the sleeves a, a tattoo on your of course on your hand and of course across your forearm the ambiguous like you know rock eyebrow glancing off into the distance keeping an eye on your haters oh yeah 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 and then oh okay you've got carl cox charlotte the wit people that i recognize nikki romero and quintino that might be a reason why she gets a bit of hate too in it charlotte the wit because she does she does occupy a really weird place in hit in dj world isn't it she kind of is with all she's kind of with all the people on the other side of stuff that i listen to but she also kind of occupies this side of things where you know again they're flying around in private jets and uh eating foie gras and you know whatever it may be on some beach somewhere in saint tropez and listening to some you know uh coked up oligarch tell them stories of his glory years i don't know there's a guy called quintino someone called anger fist that's a mad name, isn't it? Anger fist. Oh, anger fisting. <laughs> Zed. Very uninspiring looking dudes, isn't it? A lot of Caucasian men, though, isn't it? That's something you can definitely uh, ascribe to the old um, DJ Mag list. If there's, again, I'm not one for racial representation or gender equality and all that sort of nonsense, but Jesus Christos, mate. The only thing you have to do to make you on this list is be white and somewhat normal looking in it for the most part. Diplo, of course, he's a legend. He's okay. He gets grandfathered in on that one. Danny Alvia wearing a what? Is that like a top man suit or something? I don't know. Someone called Matten, a girl, girl here finally. But, you know, a conventional looking EDM type of woman as well. Not to be sad, not to be out of order for her, but you know what I mean. Some guy called Clapton. Clapton. Who's this? Two Jamo, Viani. Like, who are these people? Legitimately, Mary Mariana Bo, who looks a little bit like Nina Kravitz. You've got Ilium. Where's that? Is that Helium without the H? Alessa, who I kind of recognise name wise. Headhunters. Loads of black. No, not a lot of people here like colours, isn't it? Adam Bayer, who's been getting a lot of stick online in it during COVID. <laughs> this is probably the face, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, I, li I listen Wonderland who I've seen around name mentioned Paul Van Dyke too many I'm not going to go through the whole thing here who's this Miss Kate Miss Kate Miss Kate kind of looks like a hybrid of, of Halsey and somebody else now she's got a very interesting face there Ferry Corsten like God almighty there's so many people on this list but again it's fan voted right i don't have an issue with it i think it's it's of course i'm sure some of these votes or some of these polls have a disproportionate impact in terms of bookings for some of these people but hey if the fans vote for it and they kind of want to push their favorite artists forward i don't see an issue with it personally some of the names you know of course you got garbage Emily lens on there great uh Mate, honestly, somebody's name that Nina Kravitz recognized, of course, Dead Mouse. This is so strange, isn't it? Peggy Goose on that list, Jamie Jones. So I guess there is, it's, it's a weird blessing and a curse, isn't it? Because immediately, if you're on this list, you can definitely, it's definitely safe to say that you're definitely occupied a business techno and this stuff, isn't it? You're looked upon a bit, you're looked down upon somewhat. You know, people kind of look at you as a bit of a, I won't say sellout, but you know what it is. You probably not looked at the best way of oh, green velvet can never get looked at as a sellout, but it must be very difficult if you're on this list and to have, to kind of, you know, wear this with your, wear this on your chest and kind of boast about it. Black coffee again, top boy, Deborah DeLuca, miss me with that shit. 
miss me miss me with that shit never have i seen a more media if ever was a dj that there's probably the only dj legitimately who can make me go to sleep with her sets like just god almighty uh marco carola another fucking warrior in a scene legend of playing the marathon sets and always looking like you know have i have you have you ever seen marco carola smile i don't think i have but yeah what an interesting list man check out yourself dj mag top 100 um if some of these artists are your favorites i'd love to know why um maybe list a song that you actually like from them that i can check out that might convert me but for the most part some of these people on these lists are complete and utter garbage the headshots make it even worse and um you know if they all disappear tomorrow no one would miss them apart from their mums let's move on let's move on um what else do we have here oh we have this very interesting article courtesy of mix mag where marshall jefferson basically describes why he or explains why he decided to quit djing and it's pretty sad to read actually and you know although i don't agree with some of the points listed i can kind of understand where he's coming from in his position of being an og and a veteran in the scene you know again that move your body song from I don't know when it was in the 80s. I must, uh, it must have come out, and I, I'm assuming I heard it first, maybe early 2000s. You know, hearing that for the first time on the dance floor, like hearing "Can You Feel It," like phew, insane. So you know, legend. So it's sad to see somebody that I kind of hold up in high esteem for his productions, and obviously DJ and skills feel as if like his voice isn't needed or isn't necessarily being respected or put on the same platform as others in the scene at the moment. So let's quickly read through what he had to say. He says, and I say, courtesy of Mixed Mag, Marshall Jefferson, why I quit DJing. Zoom in. Zoom in. Zoom in a little bit. It says here, I remember being on a panel, he says here, on a new music seminar with the late Tony Wilson called America Doesn't Respect This Black Artist. In the ready room, I was told by Tony that when the Beatles came, the Beatles came to America in the 60s, they looked up some of these blues heroes that they were all dishwashers and busboys. He saw um, house music blowing up for a white artist and was concerned that black house artists couldn't cash in the same way. Now, nothing has really changed in that regard. I think the same still applies. Um, whether or not the reasonings for him are pretty simple, I don't think they are. I think they're a lot more complex, but it's the same sort of issue going on at the moment. I don't think anyone, I won't say anyone has a claim. Obviously, people have claims to musical genres and uh, or you know the origins of it but in terms of what it ends up evolving into i think it is what it is i think if anything the diversification of the scene and the interest and the genres and the different you know communities that exist it provides ample opportunity for people to come in and essentially create their own little ecosystem but again that's a lot more harder to do than it is to plug and play into you know an already established place and sort of kind of make your way in there but of course those places are hard to get into because guess what everyone wants to get into them it continues here to cut about to cut about five years later at a party in germany the party was a festival at a train station it was huge a top-tiered white british dj played in the main room and did one of the trademark lush openings and emptied the floor <laughs> everyone packed into the room i was playing the sexy house room which was smaller but still held roughly four thousand people which is still massive in it i had a great set and when i read about the event in the music magazine however they said the white dj had a sensational set and was i was horrible i promptly sent a nasty letter complaining about the reporting of the magazine and they published it that wasn't a racial event in my opinion it was economics let me explain the white dj had a great publicist and a media machine behind him that was the reason for his favorable press i didn't have a publicist and that's the reporter thought that slagging me off would have no consequences which I think Jim, he's being honest about the situation there. I guess the only lesson to be learned from this would be maybe hire a publicist. Um, that was obviously be interesting. I think, of course, nowadays, it's probably a lot difficult to put out these sort of narratives and sort of spin stories to kind of favor one or so the other because immediately, if you want to, most, I, I'd, I'd probably think, I would assume most big DJs, especially with a big enough following, have got one or two people walking around or following them when they go to gigs and filming little bits of clip, filming little bits of content that they can share after the fact. I'm sure most people do it, or if not, I'm sure there are hundreds, if not thousands of kids in these people's DMs willing to, you know, fly out and attend these events for free just so they can get close to their hero and film some content for them. So that should be a easy way to kind of fix that issue continues here 
then again, late 90s, the Dutch DJs, of course, it says late 90s, um, started getting their crowd to fill out ballots to send them in to get ranks in DJ Max Top 100 poll. They, we laughed at them at the time, but guess what? Those DJs literally came out of nowhere and started topping polls and cashing in big time. Their fees jumped into the hundreds of thousands again, and that wasn't racism because all black DJs thought we were too cool to promote ourselves like that. And this could have helped with the Norwegian DJs or Slovakian DJs or Croatian DJs, but the Dutch thought of it and actually did it. So they just have to cash in, which is definitely true. I think, I think widely in general, it seems like there is a little bit of a snobby attitude to list and poll. So I'm not too sure why that is. I still don't understand why Resident Advisor took away their poll. I think that DJ poll was maybe the best on the market, on the scene. It allowed people to actually attend the events or, you know, clicked attending or actually attended them physically. I remember how they judged it in the back end to vote for their favorite DJs who they went to go see. All right. So you had an accurate representation. And again, from my inkling, outside of maybe the top 30, which was probably the same, they sort of rotated around here and there. But outside of top 30, you had some very interesting names being banded around and it really provided an avenue for punters like myself to go and discover new people, right? When you see somebody like a Zip, or I don't know, whoever it may have been, right? Ranked number 15, 35 or 45, right? It sparks your interest because you're like, hold on, the first 20, 30 people I know, right? They're household names. So if this person who I've not really heard about is number 45 there should be somebody should be paying attention to then you click their name you click on the events that they played at previously you read for the comments people are saying some amazing stuff about how they played some people will even go as far as saying hey the sound system was pr pretty shit but this dj still brought the heat right all these really great things came off the back of having that community having those comments up on an ra having that poll and of course it also provided an avenue for the teachers themselves to basically boost their profile and obviously get more bookings right off the back of being ranked high on a list i'm sure that uh, you know, i'm sure those ra polls played a significant role in you know in making dixon the household name that he is now right even though he won it three times in a row i'm sure winning it three times in a row it, you know outside of him being a good dj himself and being more respected by his peers i'm sure for the actual you know for the general uh Punter, for the general promoter out there who just wants to book someone that's going to sell tickets it definitely helps to book that person that gets ranked number one number two all the time in the top you know 100 list and djs on a platform that's very well respected and then of course that obviously helps them to raise their fee raise their profile bloody blah, blah 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 but it's actually a net pe benefit for real it's definitely a net benefit of course for the more lazy promoters it's just a cheat code to go out and book the best people and you know slot them in there but that happens all the time um so i didn't really see the aspect of it of getting rid of it in that respect and i guess if you're a dj and you kind of poo pooed list and you kind of got left behind you got no one to blame really and i think marsh jefferson is being really honest about that in this case here so that's good to see i'll continue here um, when I first thought about racism in music, I tend to break it down into numbers. He said, there are more white people than minorities. If you have 10 times more white people than other min one minority, you have 10 times the audience. White people want white heroes. Black people want black heroes. Indian people want Indian heroes. Chinese want Chinese heroes. If you put up music on a white artist, that's 10 times the audience of anyone else. So if the record label gives a white artist a million, then gives a more talented black artist 50,000, that's economics. And this is where I kind of disagree and I sort of diverge. I don't think um, life can be reduced to just binary black white this or that i think it's a lot more complicated than that especially when it comes to the arts to suggest that white people only want to listen to other whites is just disingenuous and obviously um, very much not representative of what i see when i go out or what i see when i look at festival lineups especially in the uk especially in parts of europe there are many people that get again maybe not as many as i would like maybe not as many of the people that are getting left out would like themselves but there's definitely um a lot to be said for the people that attend the events who cover a wide ranging um you know uh racial and whatever background right and and also the people that actually play on the lineups um of course whether or not you want to boost the you know boost the sort of participant participation rates or numbers of those said uh demographics of people that's one thing but to suggest that whites only want to listen to whites is just mad wrong continues here um, so it's house music colorless hell to the nah because of the numbers color is everything carl cox won one of the first dj 
the contest on talent alone before the Dutch took it over. But if you ask Carl, but if you ask if Carl is making 250,000k a night, like some of the millionaire white DJs, you'll hear a resounding no. Mm, I'm not sure that's true. I think Carl Cox is making a decent living. I'm pretty sure he's making upwards of that money, if not more. Um, Carl is the top black DJ fee wise that, that we have. We can't get paid what the white DJs get paid because of the numbers, not his fault. And again, I don't think that's true. Again, if, if you classify Seth Trucks as a black DJ, I'm pretty sure he gets paid pretty highly too. So um, I don't think that's necessarily right. Continues here. Last year, I played a packed club in Ibiza for 4,000 plus people. I got about $2,000. Um, I found out the DJ that played at an empty club next door got 250,000 euros and decided to quit DJing. Which <laughs> I can understand, but that's probably more so You've got to blame your agent or your booking manager in that regard, isn't it? I would say, I don't know. Um, I'd previously thought that if you fill the club, you deserve the money. Simple. When guys get paid more than me for an empty club, I'm out. Um, that wasn't all the fault of racism. That was mostly on me and my dumb business practices. Again, great for him to acknowledge that. He continues, but black DJs will never get 250,000 plus fees like white DJs. That's not true. That's racism, but not in the KKK. I hate black people in a sense. It's all in the numbers. Black people are in a bad investment number wise because we're getting a tenth of the audience again i don't think that's true and even if that was true right wouldn't there be a need a real desire for blacks to kind of self-organize and open up your own spots or open up our own agencies um to facilitate and to kind of cater for that audience and cultivate it somewhat in order to kind of you know again boost the signal some of these uh, djs playing out there that would make more sense wouldn't it i would say but again, I don't necessarily think that's true. I think there there are plenty of black DJs out there making 250k plus per year. Again, whether or not there's a lot of DJs in, because again, it's it's hard to quantify, isn't it? Because you know, again, like you said previously, you know, why it's a majority in most of these places where dance music is, you know, the number one. I don't know, dance music is as big as it may be, but. I still think if you're a minority in that scene, you still get paid according to the market, especially if you've got a good agent, right? They're not going to pay you up below your market rate. It's just not going to happen unless you just work out a bad deal. <clears throat> it continues here. Some of us in pop music break through, Beyonce, Michael Jackson, rappers, etc. But house music, nope. House music is a capital of race discrimination in the music biz. It wasn't like that at first. In the beginning, I thought it was level playing field, but in the rise of ADM, saw the economic power transfer into the hands of white people because only white DJs are making EDMs well, so why don't you make it then? The same thing happened with rock and roll, black artists just don't make it today and black artists don't make it EDM so again well, I don't understand what the argument here is, do, do, does he want retroactive pay like it's odd, Kevin Saunderson said recently you almost feel like somebody is basically eliminating black artists and producers from participating in being part of the scene um, I don't know if it's intentional or not, but it's definitely happening at the top levels. And with the success of EDM dominating the industry, newer fans and newcomers to dance music don't know the origins of the music and no recognition um, of the black roots of the music eroded to the point of no return. Festivals are now the behemoth of the events industry, pre-COVID times at least, and black artists are now strangely absent from the lineups. <laughs> that's a hard one to kind of dissect because i think a lot of this really comes down to the differences in sort of like american um dance music culture and european and i guess there is a definite tendency or preference to book more european djs than north american djs who happen to be the same people who would argue that they birthed or invented the genre that we're all enjoying at the moment whether it's techno whether it's house whether it's disco but it's just a, i don't know if it's just a cultural difference unfortunately you don't really see many forget color there's not a lot of american djs in the european scene and european market people that play you know the places that we all know and love like Berghain and the school when that was still open a uh, sub club and all these other places that are american they don't really exist there's probably a handful of these djs that play um from north america that kind of tore around europe for the most part um which is disappointing and again it's disappointing more so because you know as i mentioned previously with the history of the paradise garage and studio 54 and arena and all these other legendary places that somehow the dance music scene in the u.s has sort of did you know uh dissolved into just leaving you know dissolved itself and the only thing that stands now is edm very very odd so that might be a part of the reason there's no places at home 
for these um you know legends of the game pioneers of their genres to sort of uh, maintain a steady income maintain a great following and be, and still be somewhat relevant so they're of course trying to fight for whatever spots are available in europe and unfortunately the competition for slots and places and lineups is just so fierce that i would imagine some people unfortunately even if you are a pioneer even if you were somebody that quote-unquote invented a genre i could definitely see a i could definitely envisage 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 um a situation where this person like a marshall jefferson could rock up to ibifa and he could be getting paid far less than a nick falcon nick fan fan Cooley, right someone like that or that you know, i can definitely see that happening it continues here says there seems to be a lack of receptiveness towards black owned institutions in dance music and when we as black artists get involved in white institutions they choose to alter our art to market it towards a white audience i'm experiencing that as we speak i feel my music has been remixed and whitewashed to sell the reason is more white sounding dance record they sell will be better what did they did they sell the reason they say says is more white sounding dance records they feel will sell better which is probably right of course no one is better sounding white than actual white artists again i don't think it's so binary that black and white but again maybe i'm wrong here uh, last bit says uh, i'd like a chance to expose our music um unaltered and to see what happens just play our music undiluted unformatted it worked countless times before there are several black artists i've seen that are getting their music whitewashed and i think it's unfair if you put out some of the stuff its original form it will sell if it promoted but pro labels want it to sound more like edm i think that cripples us change can take place only one way you have to allow more variety of your pop and festival playlists i maintain to this day that nobody wants to hear a one you one style of music all night with dance music switch it up it's worked before i don't know who knows maybe that's true i just think a lot of it is a lot of victimhood type of stuff that i'm not really down for i think there's such a bright moment especially now in a post-covid world for people to, to come out and open up their own places i'm sure venues and locations are probably you know uh cheaper than they've ever been in recent years they, you know if you really are feeling a bit away about the way people are you know breaking down their lineups and setting up their festivals do your own thing set it up and if there is such a demand for it as you feel the people will follow um but again i just think it's so difficult to run a successful nightclub to run a to put together a successful um you know uh festival especially you know prior to covid you know everyone and the, everyone and their mother had a festival so i can i can understand why some people are like you know what now nah, i want to just plug into something that's already there why can't i do it like my peers blah 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 but the complaining is just yeah not for me personally again sad to hear from a legend like marshall jefferson that he feels that way but i can't co-sign any of that unfortunately i just can't do it what else do we have here bah, 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 bah. oh we have some news we have some news we have finally we have a basic yeah, i guess an update and some clarification which we should have already known um all the car t fans out there i'm talking about playboy car t and the uh, um the endless wait that we've had for you know whole lot of red ever since it was you know announced um indirectly via carti in that random video where i think he's in a jewelry store and he kind of mentions his new album's going to be called whole lot of red why he's getting a bit of jewelry then i'm not too sure if it's jewelry i'm not thinking it might be a heck or whatever it is right um and ever since then we've obviously been inundated with leaks you know via some you know via some very unscrupulous people and we all kind of came to the realization as fans that hey this is probably going to negatively affect the rollout of this album but we held that hope you know we get given some morsels of hope via engineers and producers and people within this inner circle but ultimately nothing really materialized and now we finally got some sort of resolution as to what exactly is going on and again i don't know who this guy is i'm not too sure if I, I can't authenticate his position but this outline of the story regarding playboy car is whole lot of red and why we haven't seen it gives us a fair indication is sounds as accurate as can be in terms of what's going on and um it's looking like next year basically that's the tldr <laughs> but let's continue with the screenshot so this is from a guy called squirt reynolds uh tweets the following whole lot of red is currently shelled with no eta as of october 2020 this album caused an internal mess that even affected the release schedule of two other interscope artists right 
No, he's such an enigma, isn't it? The, what, what does um, Houseman call him? Um, is it the gay vampire or something? I don't know. It continues here. Um, the album is stuck in a limbo of bouncing through different parties, which constantly results in a fundamental change to the project. It's not primarily Carti's fault per se that the album is not out yet. The two different drafts were almost supposed to come out this year alone. Jesus Christ. Both times it didn't happen due to external factors. Leaks were not the main issue. I wonder what those external factors are. Do you think it's just Carti? Because I remember someone saying, ages ago i remember reading i mean i was watching a documentary i forgot what it was maybe listen to a podcast something of the other um i remember someone saying something like oh um if you hear yeah if 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 anyone ever says something like oh what happened to so-and-so in the industry entertainment industry right like an artist a director um you know a stuntman whatever right if ever you find yourself saying that in a conversation or you hear someone saying that most more likely than not it's either one of two scenarios either the person is um addicted to drugs and you know in that sort of spiral and crashing out and not necessarily concentrating on their work or number two whatever work they're doing isn't necessarily resonating with the public and no one gives a shit right something along those kind of lines those are sort of usually the two outcomes so whenever there's a delay whenever there's um, a lack of material lack of explanation um whatever it may be it's usually one of those two scenarios so whenever so especially whenever i've seen Kai lately in those re- in recent images again i'm not one to speculate but you know why not it's a podcast you meant to speculate but i do get the feeling he's probably not within he's probably not um the most sober-minded person at this current moment in time it could be because of his you know home situation we don't know but i do get the feeling that he's somebody that you know has gained a, a lot of success pretty quickly in his career off the back of what two very good albums but you know two albums alone shouldn't be enough to make you a legend but he's unfortunately a legend um of course for us i think you know if he had if he had more to kind of aim for i guess he'd be a bit more hungry for it but people like uzi people like carty they 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 know deep down that they're so far ahead of their people of the people within their within their class or their peer group that there's no need to really try above and beyond to kind of you know cement that they know that they're really at the top echelon of uh rappers within their sort of age group or within their sort of kind of current timeline so that might naturally affect it um and again maybe it's just overindulging on the drugs you have no idea but let's continue here it says the most interesting thing that has, has to be is that the interesting thing so it says has be that the Carty's team at interscope at one point hit a wall and even played with the whole four of dropping the entire whole lot of red branding jesus christ to go with a completely new branding to avoid the baggage that comes with it of course because it's been what nearly a year maybe two years i think that never materialized though shows you how frantic they were with this whole project at some points um i could i wouldn't expect it before 2021 jesus christ <laughs> which makes sense i mean i think didn't we hear something from somebody in the camp that said something like oh it's not coming out this year it's going to come out next year and people still didn't listen to it. i guess the Kai fan base just was holding out hope that it would sneak out and release before the end of the year but i'm pretty sure somebody close within the camp told us that we were going to get it next year so it continues here it says um go explore new artists in the meanwhile a lot of music came out this year harassing Kai directly won't do anything and isn't fair to him i say that as someone who doesn't even enjoy his music it's out of his control probably not the update most of you guys hoped for i know i still want to thank you though for hitting 2k honestly i did the tweet more so as a joke not expecting anything or anything but you guys ran with it and i did it i have more concrete info on other projects coming soon so stick around if you're interested in that so yeah i guess that's the case no whole lot of red until sometime next year if that um who knows um maybe as well there might be an aspect where because tori and so because um uzi and kai tore so well there could be an aspect with them where they might be in such shitty deals that the only reason the only, it only makes sense for them to make music if they can tour because you know touring around the country around the world you know you get a set performance fee which is you know in the high what eight figures or something stupid like that plus whatever you get for features they eat very very well off the back of that and again some residuals from the music but for the most part most of their kind of chunk of money will come off the back of that and of course merch sales all that malarkey so 
I could understand why they'd think, you know, it doesn't necessarily make monetary sense to put out an album right now. It really doesn't. And will it really move the needle? Will it really change anything trajectory wise for Kai or for Uzi to put out? No, most of Kai to put out a whole lot of red. Probably not. It's so well, it's so anticipated and it's already been so long now as it is. There's no harm waiting another year when things get back to normal, announcing a worldwide tour and then putting out the album after the fact. I don't necessarily think people will be that mad at that at all. So let's see, uh, let's see. Maybe people are mad at it, but I don't think that's fair considering what's going on. What else is next on here? Oh, okay, cool. Let's move to this one. We've got an interesting clip here. An interesting clip, courtesy of Two Bears, One Cave, a pretty good podcast on the Your Mum House Network, um, where Bert Kreisch and Tom Segura sit down and essentially try to make each other laugh until they faint, in the you know immutable words of Bert Kreischer. And towards the end of the podcast, they decided to phone Whitney Cummings for a little impromptu chat, and she decided to go a bit hard in the paint at our boy Chris D'Elia, which... You know, some people have interpreted as her sort of throwing him under the bus again, which I don't necessarily think is true. I do think it was a bit of harmless ribbing between some friends. It might be an indication that Crystal Lee might be coming up from, you know, it might be coming back up into the scene and kind of popping his head, you know, above the the parapet and sort of checking the landscape and, you know, maybe making a reintroduction. Um, or it could just be her actual real feelings regarding the issue. But let me play a little bit of the clip here so you guys can have an idea of what I'm talking about and then we can discuss it when the clip ends. Let's go here. Boom. And it was, it's so um, unbelievable that I actually did an episode about it on my critically acclaimed network sitcom, Whitney. Mm-hmm. Um, Wait, I saw show. that. Who else was in that? Um, Chris D'Elia was in that. Um, that American, America's Sweetheart, Chris D'Elia. <laughs> okay. Keep going, I keep going. I, I regret nothing. I regret nothing. Okay. He's incredibly talented. Okay, um, keep going, keep going. Would have done the same thing again. Don't cut this out. Don't you dare. I'm not no. cutting it out. Don't you dare. Don't worry, they won't cut it out like you deleted his podcast from your channel. Don't worry about that. Cut this out. <laughs> Um, and, uh, we did an episode about me telling my boyfriend character in the show, Chris D'Elia, which is obviously fiction because I was, you know, 25 at the time. I was way too old for him. So it was obviously not <laughs> based on real life for them. Again, is that necessary really considering what he's legitimately going through? And I guess it probably... It's a lot funnier when it comes from people that aren't necessarily that attached to Crystalia, right? I guess it has a lot more comedic. Again, this isn't me just judging it. What do I know about comedy, right? I'm just some bloody kid somewhere sitting in London chatting on my household. But from my POV, right? It would be a lot funnier coming from someone that doesn't know him, right? Just to take the piss out of the situation. Be like, oh, look at those flipping LA tosses, bloody blah, 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 right? Rib him a bit, just, you know, poke him. Um, poke at him of course making fun of him for allegedly dealing with underage girls blah 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 but if you're within the LA comedy scene I'm sorry and you're in that podcast circuit Chris Adia was around right he was friends with everybody he was appearing on everyone's shows because he got good numbers his fan base is fanatical um, and every time I heard him mentioned on other podcasts whatever you always heard of him was number one he was a beast he absolutely killed on stage he lit that place he lit the comedy store on fire um, it was hard to follow, blah de blah blah blah. And the other thing you always heard was that he has um a bit of a sweet tooth for the ladies, right? He always seemed to have like a haram, a harem, or however you pronounce that word, of young ladies surrounding him wherever he walked around the comedy store. He don't he's he's kind of the only sort of resident rock star comedian, right, in that scene, which maybe explained why Dane Cook might have not liked Crystal Lee. I don't know, right? But that was basically what you've always heard in the grapevine between, you know reading between the lines now could it be would it be a stretch to say if you're Whitney Cummings and you worked with Chris in the beginning right when you were making your show and you were kind of working your way through Hollywood and you cast him in the show you writ him in the show and all this stuff and you spent a lot of time in his company could it be argued that you probably have a better understanding especially as a woman right women have this sort of sixth sense and they can pick up on douchebags pick up on little um things that men do couldn't you be wouldn't you be said that you would have a fair idea of who your friend is and 
what sort of things that he gets up to outside of comedy just for your interactions even just from just reading between the lines and catching a vibe you don't need to see all of it directly she doesn't need to stand in front of his hotel room and check the idea of everyone is coming to his room but for her to kind of you know rib him like this making it seem as if she had no idea what was going on especially in the in the aftermath of the situation because i think this would have been all fine and dandy if she came out and sort of you know was non-committal about the issue wanted to take some time to process her feelings and then say hey he's my friend i'm gonna back him as much as i can da, 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 da. but she came out straight away and pushed him away do you know what i mean straight away and if you believe what you hear on other podcasts she supposedly lent him help and then completely iced him and stopped answering his phone calls just did the entire quintessential hollywood thing where you cancel somebody without allowing them to stand up for themselves or defend themselves or have any kind of recourse or you know whatever it may be called in this kind of issue and concerning how serious the allegations were you would have hoped that he would have had a bit more of an opportunity to kind of fight his own case or to you know stand up for himself or to have his friends stand up for him right in the podcast like especially if you imagine the amount of adsense dollars these guys have made off of his appearance on shows and sponsorships and and all that sort of malarkey and driving of traffic on their sites like it's just really interesting to see how quickly these very same people have turned around and essentially uh dance in his grave now again this would be more understandable if this was an up and coming door guy at a comedy store who wanted to take the piss because they've had some rough interactions with Chris because of course maybe he came in and big timed them or something or you know you know sort of ignored them or whatever it may be and you know because he's essentially cancelled there is an open slot that's kind of freed itself up so if you're a door guy or an up and coming comic it probably will I could probably understand why you'd want to stick the boot in right and sort of you know make it known that you don't agree with what he did so that you can kind of virtue signal your way up on the lineup I can understand that but if you're someone like a Whitney Cummins and you're established you've got your name cemented in this industry you've of course created a what is it um a, what was the show I don't know she mentioned it previously right you've got obviously some writing chops and super talented well regarded you know people always talk about you really well there's nothing really to be gained from virtue signaling about what you feel your ex best friend got up to behind closed doors and how you feel that kind of impacted your career it, it's just there's nothing to be gained from it whatsoever and again the allegations so far are pretty flimsy unless they know something that we don't because we don't know these people right we they don't know us an explanation we don't know if things are going to be on the scenes but there could be something to be, to be said for like okay she might be his best friend so she might know more than we know in the public fair but from what we know so far the allegations are widely widely have so far been um under scrutiny don't really hold up too well right and it looks like if anything it's a bit of an embarrassing situation but in terms of him actually committing a crime or actually hooking up with underage girls that's not necessarily the fact essentially what's happened so it's odd that she'd want to do this but again you know maybe it's all fell all's fair in love and comedy or whatever maybe let's continue Jesus. Um, but it was so unbelievable in real life that we made a show about him not believing me and then we played one on one and then I kicked oh, his I ass. Pa almost passed out. I kicked his ass in the. He's so annoying sometimes, but I know no, he didn't pass out. He does that every show. He nearly passes out. The show, but also almost passed in out. real life. And this is before I had to tweet. And then cut to 15 years later, me tweeting about him. It's. Whole no, thing. We got it. Yes, I'm, I'm good at basketball. With friends like Whitney, who needs enemies in it? I don't know. Man. Again, maybe it's some harmless ribbing. I'm sure if I was Crystal Lee, I wouldn't be too pleased about having my friends cackling and giggling about my demise, especially considering how serious the allegations are and considering the fact that most of the allegations look a bit um, don't really hold up to the light, right? Don't really hold up to any sort of scrutiny for the most part. And again, it's Whitney Cummings, right? I mean, she's probably one of his better friends in the scene, knows him pretty well. To go out and say these kind of things doesn't necessarily help the situation, unless, of course, there's some sort of agreement behind the scenes that she's going to drop his name in there and that's going to help him come back and drive conversations. But just considering how 
poorly she handled the situation the fact that she came out quite quickly and threw chris under the bus started going through a what it feels like a midlife crisis with all the color changes and hair color changes and wacky outfits and the you know the bearing of the skin on the social media and the weird middle-aged mum first traps and shit i don't know i don't know maybe i'm reading too much into it i'd love to know what you guys think in the comments below do you think whitney Cummins was um overstep the mark do you think she was just taking some polite jabs at her you know still best friend i'm not too sure i'd love to know what you think down below in the comments and also is there any possibility for chris coming back will he ever make a comeback will he ever address the allegations publicly and talk about them or will he just kind of embarrassingly you know retreat in his mansion and raise his kid in quiet and just kind of hope it all kind of goes away let me know what you think in the comments down be low anyway that's it for the excellent English show episode number 398 thanks so much for tuning in as per usual it's a pleasure to have your company if it's your first time tuning into a show make sure you click um smash that like button yeah smash that thumbs up like button wherever it may be hit subscribe and of course leave me a comment down below and if, if you're listening via the podcast that please leave me a five star review and share the show with all your friends but until next time my friends see you guys very very soon take care be safe bye